The recording you're about to hear is from 1967, and it perfectly describes the world we live in today. Recorded by Myron C. Fagan, an American filmmaker who claimed to have seen secret documents that not only prove the existence of the Illuminati, but also link them to major events that occurred worldwide. These seemingly random events were not random at all. They were carried out by a secret group of individuals who have been orchestrating these events since the beginning of time. This satanic plot was launched back in the 1760s when it first came into existence under the name of the Illuminati. This Illuminati was organized by one Adam Weishaupt, born a Jew, who was converted to Catholicism and became a Catholic priest. And then, at the behest of the then newly organized House of Rothschild, defected and organized the Illuminati. Naturally, the Rothschilds financed that operation. And every war since then, beginning with the French Revolution, has been promoted by the Illuminati operating under various names and guises. I say under various names and guises because after the Illuminati was exposed and became too notorious, Weishaupt and his co-conspirators began to operate under various other names. In the United States, immediately after World War I, they set up what they called the Council on Foreign Relations, commonly referred to as the CFR. And this CFR is actually the Illuminati in the United States. And its hierarchy, the masterminds in control of the CFR, to a very great extent, are the descendants of the original Illuminati conspirators. But to conceal that fact, most of them changed their original family names to American sounding names. For example, the true name of the Dillons, Clarence and Douglas Dillon, once Secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department, is Lepowski. I'll come back to all this later. There is a similar establishment of the Illuminati in England, operating under the name of the British Institute of International Affairs. There are similar secret Illuminati organizations in France, Germany, and other nations, operating under different names. And all these organizations, including the CFR, continuously set up numerous subsidiary or front organizations that are infiltrated into every phase of the various nations' affairs. But at all times, the operations of these organizations were and are masterminded and controlled by the internationalist bankers who in turn were and are controlled by the Rothschilds. One branch of the Rothschild family had financed Napoleon. Another branch of the Rothschilds, both branches, the real masterminds of the Illuminati, financed Britain, Germany, and the other nations in the Napoleonic Wars. Immediately after the Napoleonic Wars, the Illuminati assumed that all the nations were so destitute and so weary of wars that they'd be glad for any solution. So the Rothschild Stooges set up what they called the Congress in Vienna, and at that meeting they tried to create the first League of Nations, their first attempted one world government. On the theory that all the crowned heads of the European governments were so deeply in debt to them that they would willingly or unwillingly serve as their stooges. But the Tsar of Russia caught the stench of the plot and completely torpedoed it. The enraged Nathan Rothschild, then the head of that dynasty, vowed that someday he or his descendants would destroy the Tsar and his entire family. And his descendants did accomplish that very threat in 1917. At this point, bear in mind that the Illuminati was not set up to operate on a short-range basis. Normally, a conspirator of any type enters into a conspiracy with the expectation of achieving his objective 
during his own lifetime. But that was not the case with the Illuminati. True, they hoped to accomplish their objective during their lifetime. But, paraphrasing, the show must go on, the Illuminati operates on the very long-range basis. Whether it will take scores of years or even centuries, they have dedicated their descendants to keep the plot boiling until, they hope, the conspiracy is achieved. Now let's go back to the birth of the Illuminati. Adam Weishaupt was a Jesuit-trained professor of canon law, teaching in Ingolstadt University when he defected from Christianity to embrace the Luciferian conspiracy. It was in 1770 that the professional moneylenders, the then recently organized House of Rothschild, retained him to revise and modernize the age-old protocols of Zionism, which from the outset was designed to give the synagogue of Satan, so named by Jesus Christ, ultimate world domination, so they could impose the Luciferian ideology upon what would remain of the human race after the final social cataclysm by use of satanic despotism. Weishaupt completed his task May 1st, 1776. Now you know why May 1 is the great day with all communist nations to this very day. That was the day, May 1, 1776, that Weishaupt completed his plan and officially organized the Illuminati to put the plan into execution. That plan required the destruction of all existing governments and religions. That objective was to be reached by dividing the masses of people whom he, Weishaupt, termed goyim, or human cattle, into opposing camps in ever-increasing numbers on political, social, economic, and other issues, the very conditions we have in our country today. The opposing sides were then to be armed and incidents provided which would cause them to fight and weaken themselves and gradually destroy national governments and religious institutions. Again, I say, the very conditions in the world today. Now, just why did the conspirators choose the word Illuminati for their satanic organization? Weishaupt himself said that the word is derived from Lucifer and means holders of the light. Using the lie that his objective was to bring about a one-world government to enable those with mental ability to govern the world and prevent all wars in the future. In short, using the word peace on earth as his bait, exactly as that same bait, peace, was used by the 1945 conspirators to foist the United Nations on us, Weishaupt, financed, I repeat, by the Rothschilds, recruited some 2,000 paid followers. These included the most intelligent men in the fields of arts and letters, education, the sciences, finance, and industry. He then established lodges of the Grand Orient, Masonic lodges, to be their secret headquarters. And I again repeat, that in all of this, he was acting under orders from the House of Rothschild. The main features of the Weishaupt plan of operation required his Illuminati to do the following things to help them to accomplish their purpose. Number one, use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of men already in high places in the various levels of all governments and other fields of endeavor. Once influential persons had fallen for the lies, deceits, and temptations of the Illuminati, they were to be held in bondage by application of political and other forms of blackmail, threats of financial ruin, public exposure and physical harm, even death, to themselves and loved members of their families. Do you realize how many present top officials in our federal government in Washington are controlled in just that way 
by the CFR? Number two, Illuminati and the faculties of colleges and universities were to cultivate students possessing exceptional mental ability belonging to well-bred families with international leanings and recommend them for special training in internationalism. Such training was to be provided by granting scholarships to those selected by the Illuminists. That gives you an idea what a Rhodes Scholarship means. It means indoctrination into accepting the idea that only a one-world government can put an end to recurring wars and strife. That's how the United Nations was sold to the American people. All such scholars were to be first persuaded and then convinced that men of special talent and brains have the right to rule those less gifted on the ground that the masses don't know what is best for them physically, mentally, and spiritually. Number three, all influential people trapped into coming under the control of the Illuminati, plus the students who had been specially educated and trained, were to be used as agents and placed behind the scenes of all governments as experts and specialists, so they would advise the top executives to adopt policies which would, in the long run, serve the secret plans of the Illuminati One World Conspiracy and bring about the destruction of the governments and religions they were elected or appointed to serve. Number four, perhaps the most vital directive in Weishaupt's plan was to obtain absolute control of the press, at that time the only mass communications media, to distribute information to the public, so that all news and information could be slanted, so that the masses could be convinced that a one-world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. Now do you know who owns and controls our mass communications media? I'll tell you, practically all the movie lots in Hollywood is owned by the Laymans, Kuhn Loeb and Company, Goldman Sachs, and other internationalist bankers. All the national radio and TV channels in the nation are owned and controlled by those same internationalist bankers. The same is true of every chain of metropolitan newspapers and magazines, also of the press wire services such as Associated Press, United Press International, etc. The supposed heads of all those media are merely the fronts for the internationalist bankers who in turn compose the hierarchy of the CFR, today's Illuminati in America. Now can you understand why the Pentagon's press agent Sylvester so brazenly proclaimed that the government has the right to lie to the people? What he really meant was that our CFR-controlled government had the power to lie to and be believed by the brainwashed American people. And let's again go back to the first days of the Illuminati. Because Britain and France were the two greatest world powers in the late years of the 18th century, Weishaupt ordered the Illuminati to foment the colonial wars, including our Revolutionary War, to weaken the British Empire and organize the French Revolution to destroy the French Empire. He scheduled the French Revolution to start in 1789. However, in 1784, a true act of God placed the Bavarian government in possession of evidence which proved the existence of the Illuminati, and that evidence could have saved France if they the French government hadn't refused to believe it. Here is how that act of God happened. It was in 1874 that Weishaupt issued his orders for the French Revolution. A German writer named Zwack put it into book form. It contained the entire Illuminati story and Weishaupt's plans. A copy of this book was sent to the Illuminists in France, headed by Robespierre, 
whom Weishaupt had delegated to foment the French Revolution. The courier was struck and killed by lightning as he rode through Ralliston on his way from Frankfurt to Paris. The police found the subversive documents on his body and turned them over to the proper authorities. After careful study of the plot, the Bavarian government ordered the police to raid Weishaupt's newly organized lodges of the Grand Orient and the homes of his most influential associates. All additional evidence thus discovered convinced the authorities the documents were genuine copies of the conspiracy by which the Illuminati planned to use wars and revolutions to bring about the establishment of a one-world government, the powers of which they, headed by the Rothschilds, intended to usurp as soon as it was established exactly in line with the United Nations plot of today. In 1785, the Bavarian government outlawed the Illuminati and closed the lodges of the Grand Orient. In 1786, they published all the details of the conspiracy. The English title of that publication is The Original Writings of the Order and Sect of the Illuminati. Copies of the entire conspiracy were sent to all the heads of church and state in Europe. But the power of the Illuminati, which was actually the power of the Rothschilds, was so great that this warning was ignored. Nevertheless, Illuminati became a dirty word, and it went underground. At the same time, Weishaupt ordered Illuminists to infiltrate into the lodges of blue masonry and form their own secret societies within all secret societies. Only masons who proved themselves internationalists and those whose conduct proved they had defected from God were initiated into the Illuminati. Thenceforth, the conspirators donned the cloak of philanthropy and humanitarianism to conceal their revolutionary and subversive activities. In order to infiltrate into Masonic lodges in Britain, Weishaupt invited John Robeson over to Europe. Robeson was a high degree Mason in the Scottish Rite. He was a professor of natural philosophy at Edinburgh University and secretary of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Robeson did not fall for the lie that the objective of the Illuminati was to create a benevolent dictatorship, but he kept his reactions to himself so well that he was entrusted with a copy of Weishaupt's revised conspiracy for study and safekeeping. Anyway, because the heads of state and church in France were deluded into ignoring the warnings given them, the revolution broke out in 1789 as scheduled by Weishaupt. In order to alert other governments to their danger, in 1798 Robeson published a book entitled Proof of a Conspiracy to Destroy All Governments and Religions. But his warnings were ignored, exactly as our American people have been ignoring all warnings about the United Nations and the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. Now here is something that will stun and very likely outrage many who hear this. But there is documentary proof that our own Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton became students of Weishaupt's. Jefferson was one of Weishaupt's strongest defenders when he was outlawed by his government. And it was Jefferson who infiltrated the Illuminati into the then newly organized lodges of the Scottish Rite in New England. Here is the proof. In 1789, John Robeson warned all Masonic leaders in America that the Illuminati had infiltrated into their lodges. And on July 19, 1789, David Pappen, president of Harvard University, issued the same warning to the graduating class and lectured them on the influence Illuminism was acquiring on American politics and religion. And to top it off, John Quincy Adams, who had organized the New England Masonic Lodges, 
issued his warnings. He wrote three letters to Colonel William L. Stone, a top mason, in which he exposed how Jefferson was using Masonic lodges for subversive, illuministic purposes. Those three letters are at this very time in Rittenberg Square Library in Philadelphia. In 1826, one Captain William Morgan decided it was his duty to inform all Masons and the general public what the full truth was regarding the Illuminati, their secret plans and intended objectives, also reveal the identities of the masterminds of the conspiracy. The Illuminati promptly tried Morgan in absentia and convicted him of treason. They ordered one Richard Howard, an English Illuminist, to carry out their sentence of execution as a traitor. Morgan was warned and he tried to escape to Canada, but Howard caught up with him near the border, near the Niagara Gorge, to be exact, where he murdered him. This was verified in a sworn statement made in New York by one Avery Allen to the effect that he heard Howard render his report of the execution to a meeting of Knights Templars in St. John's Hall, New York. He also told how arrangements had been made to ship Howard back to England. That Allen affidavit is on record in New York City archives. Very few Masons and very few of the general public know that general disapproval over that incident of murder caused approximately half of all the Masons in the northern jurisdiction of the United States to secede. Copies of the minutes of the meeting held to discuss that matter are still in existence in safe hands, and that all that secrecy emphasizes the power of the masterminds of the Illuminati to prevent such terrible events of history from being taught in our schools. The Rothschilds decided that to keep the plot alive, they'd have to do it by heightening their control of the money systems of the European nations. Earlier, by a ruse, the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo had been falsified. Rothschild had spread a story that Napoleon had won that battle. That had precipitated a terrific panic on the stock market in England. All stocks had plummeted down to practically zero, and Nathan Rothschild bought all the stocks for virtually a penny on its dollar values. That gave him complete control of the economy of Britain and virtually of all Europe. So immediately after that Congress in Vienna had boomeranged, Rothschild forced Britain to set up a new Bank of England, which he absolutely controlled. Exactly as later, through Jacob Schiff, he engineered our own Federal Reserve Act, which gave the House of Rothschild a secret control of the economy in the United States. Weishaupt died in 1830, but prior to his death, he prepared a revised version of the age-old conspiracy, the Illuminati, which, under various aliases, was to organize, finance, direct, and control all international organizations and groups by working their agents into executive positions at the top. In the United States, we have Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Jack Kennedy, Johnson, Rusk, McNamara, Fulbright, etc., as prime examples. In addition, while Karl Marx was writing the Communist Manifesto under the direction of one group of Illuminists, Professor Karl Ritter of Frankfurt University was writing the antithesis under direction of another group. The idea was that those who direct the overall conspiracy could use the differences in those two so-called ideologies to enable them to divide larger and larger members of the human race into opposing camps so that they could be armed and then brainwashed into fighting and destroying each other, and particularly to destroy all political and religious institutions. The work Ritter started was continued after his death and completed by the German so-called philosopher 
Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, who founded Nietzscheism. This Nietzscheism was later developed into fascism and then into Nazism and was used to foment World Wars I and II. In 1834, the Italian revolutionary leader, Giuseppe Mazzini, was selected by the Illuminati to direct their revolutionary program throughout the world. He served in that capacity until he died in 1872. But some years before he died, Mazzini had enticed an American general named Albert Pike into the Illuminati. Pike was fascinated by the idea of a one-world government, and ultimately he became the head of this Luciferian conspiracy. Between 1859 and 1871, he, Pike, worked out a military blueprint for three world wars and various revolutions throughout the world. Again, I remind that these conspirators were never concerned with immediate success. They always operated on a long-range view. Pike did most of his work in his home in Little Rock, Arkansas. But a few years later, when the Illuminati's lodges of the Grand Orient became suspect and repudiated because of Mazzini's revolutionary activities in Europe, Pike organized what he called the New and Reformed Palladian Rite. He set up three supreme councils, one in Charleston, South Carolina, one in Rome, Italy, and the third in Berlin, Germany. He had Mazzini establish 23 subordinate councils in strategic locations throughout the world. These have been the secret headquarters of the world revolutionary movement ever since. Long before Marconi invented radio, the scientists in the Illuminati had found the means for Pike and the heads of his councils to communicate secretly. It was the discovery of that secret that enabled intelligence officers to understand how apparently unrelated incidents, one such as the assassination of an Austrian prince at Sarajevo, took place simultaneously throughout the world, which developed into a war or a revolution. Pike's plan was as simple as it has proved effective. It called for communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment three global world wars and at least two major revolutions. The first world war was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to destroy Tsarism in Russia, as vowed by Rothschild after the Tsar had torpedoed his scheme at the Congress in Vienna, and to transform Russia into a stronghold of atheistic communism. The differences stirred up by agents of the Illuminati between the British and German empires were to be used to foment this war. After the war would be ended, communism was to be built up and used to destroy other governments and weaken religions. World War II, when and if necessary, was to be fomented by using the controversies between fascists and political Zionists. And here let it be noted that Hitler was financed by Krupp, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds, and other internationalist bankers, and that the slaughter of the supposed 600,000 Jews by Hitler didn't bother the Jewish internationalist bankers at all. That slaughter was necessary in order to create worldwide hatred of the German people and thus bring about the war against them. In short, this Second World War was to be fought to destroy Nazism and to increase the power of political Zionism so that the State of Israel could be established in Palestine. As we know now, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin put that exact policy into effect, and Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson continued that same exact policy. World War III is to be fomented by using the so-called controversies, the agents of the Illuminati, operating under whatever new name, are now stirring up between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Muslim world. 
That war is to be directed in such a manner that all of Islam and political Zionism, Israel, will destroy each other, while at the same time the remaining nations once more divided on this issue will be forced to fight themselves into a state of complete exhaustion, physically, mentally, spiritually, and economically. Now can any thinking person doubt that the intrigue now going on in the near, middle, and far east is designed to accomplish that satanic objective? Pike himself foretold all this in a statement he made to Mazzini on August 15, 1871. Pike stated, those who will inspire to undisputed world domination will provoke the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. Quoting his own words, taken from the letter he wrote to Mazzini, and which letter is now catalogued in the British Museum in London, England, he said, we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people forced to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will be from that moment on without direction and leadership and anxious for an ideal but without knowledge where to send its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into public view, a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. When Mazzini died in 1872, Pike made another Italian revolutionary leader named Adrian Lemmy, his successor, Lemmy, in turn, was succeeded by Lenin and Trotsky, then by Stalin. The revolutionary activities of all those men were financed by British, French, German, and American international bankers, all of them dominated by the House of Rothschild. We are supposed to believe that the international bankers of today, like the money changers of Christ's day, are only the tools or agents of the great conspiracy, but actually they are the masterminds behind all of it. While the general public has been brainwashed by all the mass communications media, the actual fact is that both British and American intelligence officers have authentic documentary evidence that international liberals operating through their international banking houses particularly the House of Rothschild, have financed both sides in every war and revolution since 1776. Those who today comprise the conspiracy, the CFR in the United States, direct our governments, whom they hold in usury through such methods as the Federal Reserve System in America, to fight wars such as Vietnam, created by the United Nations, so as to further Pike's Illuminati plans to bring the world to that stage of the conspiracy. The headquarters of the great conspiracy in the late 1700s was in Frankfurt, Germany, where the House of Rothschild had been established by Mayor Anselm, who adopted the Rothschild name and linked together other international financiers who had literally sold their souls to the devil. After the Bavarian government's exposure in 1786, the conspirators moved their headquarters to Switzerland, then to London. Since World War II, after Jacob Schiff, the Rothschild's boy in America, died, the headquarters of the American branch has been in the Harold Pratt Building, New York, and the Rockefellers, originally protégés of Schiff, have taken over the manipulation of finances in America for the Illuminati. In the final phases of the conspiracy, 
the one world government will consist of the king dictator, head of the United Nations, the CFR, and a few billionaires, economists, and scientists who have proved their devotion to the great conspiracy. All others are to be integrated into a vast conglomeration of mongrelized humanity, actually slaves. Now let me show you how our federal government and the American people have been sucked into the one world takeover plot of the Illuminati great conspiracy. And always bear in mind that the United Nations was created to become the housing for that one world so-called liberal conspiracy. The real foundations of the plot for the takeover of the United States were laid during the period of our Civil War. Not that Weishaupt and the earlier masterminds had ever overlooked the New World. As I have previously indicated, Weishaupt had his agents planted over here as far back as the Revolutionary War. But George Washington was more than a match for them. It was during the Civil War that the conspirators launched their first concrete efforts. We know that Judah Benjamin, chief advisor of Jefferson Davis, was a Rothschild agent. We also know that there were Rothschild agents planted in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet who tried to sell him into a financial dealing with the House of Rothschild. But old Abe saw through the scheme and bluntly rejected it, thereby incurring the undying enmity of the Rothschilds, exactly as the Russian Tsar did when he torpedoed their first League of Nations at the Congress in Vienna. Investigation of the assassination of Lincoln revealed that the assassin, Booth, was a member of a secret conspiratorial group. Because there were a number of highly important government officials involved, the name of the group was never revealed and it became a mystery, exactly as the assassination of Jack Kennedy still is a mystery. The ending of the Civil War destroyed, temporarily, all chances of the House of Rothschild to get a clutch on our money system, such as they had acquired in Britain and other nations in Europe. I say temporarily because the Rothschilds and the masterminds of the conspiracy never quit. So they had to start from scratch, but they lost no time in getting started. Shortly after the Civil War, a young immigrant who called himself Jacob H. Schiff arrived in New York. Jacob was a young man with a mission for the House of Rothschild. Jacob was the son of a rabbi born in one of Rothschild's houses in Frankfurt, Germany. I won't go deeply into his background. The important point is that Rothschild recognized in him not only a potential money wizard, but more important, he also saw the latent Machiavellian qualities in Jacob that could, as it did, make him an invaluable functionary in the great one world conspiracy. After a comparatively brief training period in the Rothschild's London Bank, Jacob left for America with instructions to buy into a banking house, which was to be the springboard to acquire control of the money system of the United States. Actually, Jacob came here to carry out four specific assignments. Number one, and most important, was to acquire control of America's money system. Number two, find desirable men who, for a price, would be willing to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into high places in our federal government, our Congress, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nations particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target. Now the vast majority of the American people think that the Federal Reserve System is a United States government-owned agency. That is positively false. All of the stock of the Federal Reserve Banks is owned by the member banks, and the heads of the member banks 
are all members of the hierarchy of the great Illuminati conspiracy known today as the CFR. The details of that act of treason in which many traitorous so-called Americans participated are far too long for this recording. Now, if you think that those aliens and their by accident of birth American co-conspirators would be content with just the control of our money system, you're in for another very sad shock. The Federal Reserve System gave the conspirators complete control of our money system, but it in no way touched the earnings of the people because the Constitution positively forbids what is now known as the 20% withholding tax. But the Illuminati blueprint for one world enslavement called for the confiscation of all private property and control of individual earning powers. This, and Karl Marx stressed that feature in his blueprint, had to be accomplished by a progressive graduated income tax. As I stated, such a tax could not lawfully be imposed upon the American people. It is succinctly and expressly forbidden by our Constitution. Thus, only an amendment to the Constitution could give the federal government such confiscatory powers. Well, that too was not an insurmountable problem for our Machiavellian plotters. The same elected leaders in both houses of Congress and the same Mr. Woodrow Wilson, who signed the infamous Federal Reserve Act into law, amended the Constitution to make the federal income tax, known as the 16th Amendment, a law of the land. Both are illegal under our Constitution. In short, the same traitors signed both betrayals, the Federal Reserve Act and the 16th Amendment, into law. However, it seems that nobody ever realized that the 16th Amendment was set up to rob, and I do mean rob, the people of their earnings via the income tax provision. The plotters didn't fully use that provision until World War II, when that great humanitarian, Franklin Roosevelt, applied a 20% withholding tax on all small wage earners and up to 90% on higher incomes. Oh, of course, he faithfully promised that it would be only for the duration of the war. But what was a promise to such a charlatan who in 1940, when he was running for his third term, kept proclaiming, I say again and again and again that I will never send American boys to fight on foreign soil. Remember? He was proclaiming that even as he was already preparing to plunge us into World War II by enticing the Japanese into that sneak attack on Pearl Harbor to furnish him with his excuse. And before I forget, let me remind you that another charlatan named Woodrow Wilson used exactly that same campaign slogan in 1916. His slogan was, re-elect the man who will keep your sons out of the war. Exactly the same formula, exactly the same promises. But wait, as Al Jolson used to say, you ain't heard nothing yet. That 16th Amendment income tax trap was intended to confiscate, rob, the earnings only of the common herd, you and me. It was not intended to even touch the huge incomes of the Illuminati gang the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Laymans, and all the other conspirators. So together with that 16th Amendment, they created what they called the tax-free foundations. That would enable the conspirators to transform their huge wealth into such so-called foundations and avoid payment of virtually all income taxes. The excuse for it was that the earnings of those tax-free foundations would be devoted to humanitarian philanthropy. So we now have the several Rockefeller Foundations, the Carnegie Endowment Fund, the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and hundreds of similar tax-free foundations. And what kind of philanthropy do these foundations support? Well, they finance all the civil rights groups that are creating all the chaos and rioting all over the country. In short, the tax-free foundation finance those who are doing the job for the Illuminati great conspiracy. 
our CFR Illuminati controlled federal government can grant tax free status to all foundations and pro red one word outfits such as the Fund for the Republic. But if you or a patriotic pro organization is too outspokenly a pro American, they can terrify and intimidate you by finding a misplaced comma in your income tax report and by threatening you with penalties, fines, and even prison. Future historians will wonder how the American people could have been so naive and stupid as to have permitted such audaciously brazen acts of treason as the Federal Reserve Act in the 16th Amendment. Well, they were not naive and they were not stupid. The answer is they trusted the men they elected to safeguard our country and our people and they just didn't have even an inkling about either betrayal until after each one had been accomplished. It was the Illuminati-controlled mass communications media that kept and is keeping our people naive and stupid and unaware of the treason being committed. Now the great question is, when will the people wake up and do to our traitors of today what George Washington and our founding fathers would have done to Benedict Arnold. Actually, Benedict Arnold was a petty traitor compared to our present traitors in Washington. Now let's go back to the events that followed the rape of our Constitution by the passage of the Federal Reserve Act of the 16th Amendment. With Wilson completely under their control, the masterminds of the great conspiracy put in motion their next and what they hoped would be their final steps to achieve their one world government. The first of those steps was to be World War I. Why war? Simple. The only excuse for a one world government is that it will supposedly ensure peace. The only thing that can make people cry for peace is war. War brings chaos, destruction, exhaustion to winner as well as to loser. It brings economic ruin to both. Most important, it destroys the flower of the young manhood of both. To the saddened and heartbroken oldsters, the mothers and fathers, who are left with nothing but memories of their beloved sons, peace becomes worth any price. And that is the emotion upon which the conspirators depend for the success of their satanic plot. Throughout the 19th century, from 1814 to 1914, the world as a whole was at peace. Such wars as the Franco-Prussian, our own civil war, the Russo-Japanese war, were what might be termed local disturbances that did not affect the rest of the world. All the great nations were prosperous, the peoples staunchly nationalistic and fiercely proud of their sovereignties. It was utterly unthinkable that the French and the German peoples would be willing to live under a one-world government, or the Turks and the Russians, or the Chinese and the Japanese. Even more unthinkable that a Kaiser Wilhelm, or a Franz Joseph, or a Tsar Nicholas, or any monarch, would willingly and meekly surrender his throne to a one-world government. But bear in mind that the peoples in all nations are the real power, and only one thing, war, could make the peoples yearn and clamor for a peace ensuring one world government. But it would have to be a frightful and horribly devastating war. It could not be just a local disturbing war between just two nations. It would have to be a world war. No major nation must be left untouched by the horrors and devastation of such a war. The cry for peace must be made universal. Actually, that was the format set by the Illuminati and Nathan Rothschild at the turn of the 19th century. They first maneuvered all of Europe into the Napoleonic Wars. Then the Congress in Vienna, which they, and particularly Rothschild, planned to transform into a League of Nations, which was to have been the housing for their one world government, exactly as the present United Nations was set up to be the housing for the forthcoming God forbid, one world government. Anyway, that was the format the House of Rothschild and Jacob Schiff decided to employ to achieve their objective in 1914. 
Of course, they knew that that same format had failed in 1814, but they theorized that was only because the Tsar of Russia had torpedoed that scheme. Well, the present 1914 conspirators would eliminate that 1814 fly in the ointment. They'd make sure that after the New World War, they were conspiring, there'd be no Tsar of Russia around to throw monkey wrenches into the machinery. History records that World War I was precipitated by a trivial incident, the kind of incident both Weishaupt and Albert Pike had incorporated in their blueprints. That incident was the assassination of an Austrian archduke arranged by the Illuminati masterminds. The war followed. It involved Germany, Austria, Hungary, and their allies, so-called the Axis powers against France, Britain, and Russia, called the Allies. Only the United States was not involved during the first two years. By 1917, the conspirators had achieved their primary objective. All of Europe was in a state of destitution. All the peoples were war-weary and crying for peace. And the outcome, too, was all set. It was to come as soon as the United States would be hurled in on the side of the Allies. And that was all set to happen immediately after Wilson's re-election. After that, there could be only one outcome, complete victory for the Allies. When Wilson was campaigning for re-election in 1916, his chief appeal was, re-elect the man who will keep your sons out of the war. But during that same campaign, the Republican Party publicly charged that Wilson had long committed himself to throw us into the war. They charged that if he would be defeated, he would accomplish that act during his few remaining months in office. But if re-elected, he would hold off until after re-election. But at that time, the American people looked upon Wilson as a God-man. Well, Wilson was re-elected. And as per the schedule of the conspirators, he hurled us into the war in 1917. He used the sinking of the Lusitania as an excuse a sinking which also was prearranged. Roosevelt, also a godman in the eyes of the American people, followed the same technique in 1941 when he used the prearranged Pearl Harbor attack as his excuse for hurling us into World War II. Now exactly as the conspirators planned, victory for the Allies would eliminate all the monarchs of the defeated nations and leave all their peoples leaderless, confused, bewildered, and perfectly conditioned for the one world government the great conspiracy intended would follow. But there still would be an obstacle, the same obstacle that had balked the Illuminati and Rothschild at that Congress in Vienna peace gathering after the Napoleonic Wars. Russia would be on the winning side this time as it was in 1814, Therefore, the Tsar would be securely on his throne. Here it is pertinent to note that Russia, under the Tsarist regime, had been the one country in which the Illuminati had never made any headway, nor had the Rothschilds ever been able to infiltrate their banking interests. Thus, a winning Tsar would be more difficult than ever to cope with. Even if he could be enticed into a so-called League of Nations, it was a foregone conclusion that he would never, but never, go for a one-world government. So even before the outbreak of World War I, the conspirators had a plan in the making to carry out Nathan Rothschild's vow of 1814 to destroy the Tsar and also murder all possible royal heirs to the throne. And it would have to be done before the close of the war, and the Russian Bolsheviki were to be their instruments in this particular plot. From the turn of the century, the chiefs of the Bolsheviki were Nikolai Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and later Joseph Stalin. Of course, those were not their true family names. Prior to the outbreak of the war, Lenin headquartered in Paris. After the outbreak, Switzerland became his haven. Trotsky's headquarters were on the Lower East Side in New York, largely the habitat of Russian Jewish refugees. Both Lenin and Trotsky were similarly bewhiskered and unkempt. In those days, that was the badge of Bolshevism. Both lived well, yet neither had a regular occupation. Neither had any visible means of support, 
yet both always had plenty of money. All those mysteries were solved in 1917. Right from the outset of the war, strange and mysterious goings-on were taking place in New York. Night after night, Trotsky darted furtively in and out of Jacob Schiff's palatial mansion. And in the dead of those same nights, there were gatherings of hoodlums of New York's Lower East Side, all of them Russian refugees, at Trotsky's headquarters. And all were going through some mysterious sort of training process. But it was all shrouded in mystery. Nobody talked, although it did leak out that Schiff was financing all of Trotsky's activities. Then suddenly Trotsky vanished. So did approximately 300 of his trained hoodlums. Actually, they were on the high seas in a Schiff chartered ship bound for a rendezvous with Lenin and his gang in Switzerland. And on that ship was $20 million in gold. The $20 million Schiff provided to finance the Bolsheviki takeover of Russia. In anticipation of Trotsky's arrival, Lenin prepared to throw a party in his Switzerland hideaway. Men of the very highest places in the world were to be guests at that party. Among them were the mysterious Colonel Edward Mandel House, Woodrow Wilson's mentor and palsy Walsy, and more important, Schiff's special and confidential messenger. Another of the expectant guests was Warburg of the Warburg banking clan in Germany, who were financing the Kaiser, and whom the Kaiser had rewarded by making him chief of the secret police of Germany. In addition, there were the Rothschilds of London and Paris, also Litvinov, Kaganovich, Stalin, who was then head of a train and bank robbing gang of bandits. He was known as the Jesse James of the Urals. And here I must remind that England and France were then long in war with Germany, and that on February 3, 1917, Wilson had broken off all diplomatic relations with Germany. Therefore, Warburg, Colonel House, the Rothschild, and all those others were enemies. But of course, Switzerland was neutral ground where enemies could meet and be friends, especially if they had some scheme in common. That Lenin party was very nearly wrecked by an unforeseen incident. The Schiff chartered ship on its way to Switzerland was intercepted and taken into custody by a British warship. But Schiff quickly rushed orders to Wilson to order the British to release the ship intact with the Trotsky hoodlums and the gold. Wilson obeyed. He warned the British that if they refused to release the ship, the United States would not enter the war in April as he had faithfully promised a year earlier. The British heeded the warning, Trotsky arrived in Switzerland, and the Lenin party went off as scheduled. But they still faced what ordinarily would have been the insurmountable obstacle of getting the Lenin-Trotsky band of terrorists across the border into Russia. Well, that's where Brother Warburg, chief of the German secret police, came in. He loaded all those thugs into sealed freight cars and made all the necessary arrangements for their secret entry into Russia. The rest is history. The revolution in Russia took place, and all members of the royal Romanov family were murdered. Now, my chief objective is to establish beyond even a remote doubt that communism so-called is an integral part of the Illuminati's great conspiracy for the enslavement of the entire world. That communism so-called is merely their weapon and bogeyman word to terrify the peoples of the whole world. And that the conquest of Russia and the creation of communism was in great part organized by Schiff and the other international bankers right in our own city of New York. Charlie Knickerbocker, a Hearst newspaper columnist, published an interview with John Schiff, grandson of Jacob, in which young Schiff confirmed the entire story and named the figure old Jacob contributed, $20 million. If anybody still has even a remote doubt that the entire menace of communism was created by the masterminds of the great conspiracy right in our own city of New York, I will cite the following historical fact. All records show that when Lenin and Trotsky engineered the capture of Russia, 
they operated as heads of the Bolsheviki party. Now, Bolshevism is a purely Russian word. The masterminds realized that Bolshevism could never be sold as an ideology to any but the Russian people. So in April 1918, Jacob Schiff dispatched Colonel House to Moscow with orders to Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin to change the name of their regime to the Communist Party and to adopt the Karl Marx Manifesto as the constitution of the Communist Party. Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin obeyed. And that year of 1918 was when the Communist Party and the menace of communism came into being. All this is confirmed in Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 5th edition. In short, communism was created by the capitalists. Thus, until November 11, 1918, the entire fiendish plan of the conspirators worked perfectly. All the great nations, including the United States, were war-weary, devastated, mourning their dead. Peace was the great universal desire. Thus, when it was proposed by Wilson to set up a League of Nations to ensure peace, all the great nations, with no Russian czar to stand in their way, jumped on that bandwagon without even stopping to read the fine print in that insurance policy. That is all but one, the United States, the very one that Schiff and his co-conspirators least expected would balk. And that was their one fatal mistake in that early plot. You see, when Schiff planted Woodrow Wilson in the White House, the conspirators assumed that they had the United States in the proverbial bag. Wilson had been perfectly built up as a great humanitarian. He supposedly became established as a godman with the American people. There was every reason for the conspirators to have believed that he would easily hornswoggle Congress into buying the League of Nations sight unseen, exactly as the Congress of 1945 bought the United Nations sight unseen. But there was one man in the Senate in 1918 who saw through that scheme just as the Russian Tsar did in 1814. He was a man of great political stature, almost as great as that of Teddy Roosevelt, and fully as astute. He was highly respected and trusted by all members of both houses of Congress and by the American people. The name of that great and patriotic American was Henry Cabot Lodge, not the phony of today who called himself Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. until he was exposed. Lodge completely unmasked Wilson and kept the United States out of the League of Nations. Here it becomes of great interest to know the real reason for the Wilson League of Nations flop. As I previously stated, Schiff was sent to the United States to carry out four specific assignments. Number one and most important was to acquire complete control of the U.S. money system. Number two, as outlined in the original Weishaupt Illuminati blueprint, he was to find the right kind of men to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into the highest offices in our federal government, our Congress, our U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies, such as the State Department, the Pentagon, the Treasury Department, etc., Number three, destroy the unity of the American people by creating minority group strife throughout the nation, especially between the whites and blacks as outlined in Israel Cohen's book. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States with Christianity to be the chief target or victim. In addition, he was strongly reminded of the imperative directive in the Illuminati blueprint to achieve full control of all mass communications media, to be used to brainwash the people into believing and accepting all of the maneuverings of the great conspiracy. Schiff was warned that only control of the press, at that time our only mass communications media, would enable him to destroy the unity of the American people. Now then Schiff and his co-conspirators did set up the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, in 1909. And in 1913, he set up the Anti-Defamation League of the B'nai B'rith. Both were to create the necessary strife. 
But in the early years, the ADL operated very timidly, perhaps for fear of a pogrom-like action by an aroused and enraged American people. In addition, he, Schiff, was busy developing and infiltrating the Stooges to serve in all high places in our Washington government and in the job of acquiring control of our money system and the creation of the 16th Amendment. He also was very busy with the organizing of the plot for the takeover of Russia. In short, he was kept so busy with all those jobs that he completely overlooked the supreme job of acquiring complete control of our mass communications media. That oversight was the direct cause for Wilson's failure to lure the United States into the League of Nations because when Wilson decided to go to the people to overcome the opposition of the large-controlled Senate, despite his established but phony reputation as a great humanitarian, he found himself faced by a solidly united people and by a loyal press whose only ideology was Americanism and the American way of life, at that time due to the ineptness and ineffectiveness of both the ADL and the NAACP, there were no organized minority groups, no Negro problems, no so-called anti-Semitic problem to sway the people's thinking. There were no lefts, there were no rights, no prejudices for crafty exploitations. Thus, Wilson's League of Nation appeals fell on deaf ears. The control of the press was assigned to Rockefeller. Thus, Henry Luce, who recently died, was financed to set up a number of national magazines, among them Life, Time, Fortune, and others, which publish USSR in America. The Rockefellers also directly or indirectly financed the Cowles Brothers Look magazine and a chain of newspapers. They also financed a man named Sam Newhouse to buy up and build a chain of newspapers all over the country. And the late Eugene Meyer, one of the founders of CFR, bought the Washington Post, Newsweek, the Weekly Magazine, and other publications. At the same time, CFR began to develop and nurture a new breed of scurrilous columnists and editorial writers, such as Walter Lippmann, Drew Pearson, the Alsops, Herbert Matthews, Irwin Canham, and others of that ilk, who called themselves liberals, who proclaim that Americanism is isolationism, that isolationism is warmongerism, that anti-communism is anti-Semitism and racism. All that took time, of course, but today our entire press, except for some local small-town papers and weeklies published by patriotic organizations, is completely controlled by CFR stooges, and thus they finally succeeded in breaking us up into a nation of quarreling, wrangling, squabbling, hating factions. Now, if you still wonder about the slanted news and outright lies you read in your paper, you have the answer. To the Laymans, Goldman Sachs, Kuhn Loeb, and the Warburgs, the CFR assigned the job of getting control of the motion picture industry, Hollywood, radio and television, and believe you me, they succeeded. If you still wonder about the strange propaganda broadcasts by the Ed Murrows, Chet Huntley, Howard K. Smith, Eric Severide, Drew Pearson, and others of that ilk, you have the answer. If you wonder about all the smut, sex, pornography, and mixed marriage films you see in your movie theater and on your TV set, all of which is demoralizing our youth, you have the answer. It tells in detail how the press, the movies, TV, and radio have been, and still are, used to brainwash the people, to demoralize our youth, and they have been and still are encouraging and creating sympathy for the rioting civil rights lawlessness. To the vast majority of the American people, our foreign policy for many years has been a complete enigma. Most of us simply can't understand why this great nation is seemingly floundering so helplessly in the art of diplomacy. We can't understand why our leaders are seemingly so confused and bewildered in all their dealings. Now I have one more vital message to deliver. As I told you, 
One of the four specific assignments Rothschild gave Jacob Schiff was to create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, with Christianity to be the chief target. For a very obvious reason, the Anti-Defamation League wouldn't dare to attempt it, because such an attempt could create the most terrible bloodbath in the history of the world, not only for the ADL and the conspirators, but for the millions of innocent Jews. Schiff turned that job over to Rockefeller for another specific reason. The destruction of Christianity could be accomplished only by those who are entrusted to preserve it, by the pastors, the men of the cloth. As a starter, John D. Rockefeller picked up a young so-called Christian minister by the name of Dr. Harry F. Ward, Reverend Ward, if you please. At that time, he was teaching religion at the Union Theological Seminary. Rockefeller found a very willing Judas in this reverend. Thereupon, in 1907, he financed him to set up the Methodist Foundation of Social Service. And Ward's job was to teach bright young men to become so-called ministers of Christ and to place them as pastors of churches. While teaching them to become ministers, the Reverend Ward also taught them how to very subtly and craftily preach to their congregations that the entire story of Christ is a myth, to cast doubts on the divinity of Christ, to cast doubts about the Virgin Mary, in short, to cast doubts on Christianity as a whole. It was not to be a direct attack, but much of it by crafty insinuation that was to be applied in particular to the youth in the Sunday schools. Remember Lenin's statement? Give me just one generation of youth and I'll transform the whole world. Then, in 1908, the Methodist Foundation of Social Service, which incidentally was America's first communist front organization, changed its name to the Federal Council of Churches. By 1950, the Federal Council of Churches was becoming very suspect. So in 1950, they changed the name to the National Council of Churches. Do I have to tell you more about how this National Council of Churches is deliberately destroying faith in Christianity? I don't think so. But this I will tell you. If you are a member of any congregation whose pastor and church are members of this Judas organization, you, your contributions, are helping the Illuminati's plot to destroy religion and your faith in God and Jesus Christ. Thus you are deliberately delivering your children to be indoctrinated with disbelief in God and church and which can easily transform them into atheists. Find out immediately if your church is a member of the National Council of Churches and for the love of God and your children. If it is, withdraw from it at once. However, let me warn you, that same destroy religion process has been infiltrated into other denominations. But of course, there are many individual churches and pastors who are honest and sincere. Find one such for yourself and for your children.